We'll get started with our afternoon program, and we welcome Father Ron Rollheiser back to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, how, how is that a sound? Okay. Just before I get into the material, a couple of you have asked about the slides. What I will do is I'll send those slides to Margaret, and if anybody wants them, you got them. Okay. okay. A couple of little stories to start with this afternoon. They're catechetical in their own way, but um, true stories. You know, we had this marvelous presentation last night on a Samaritan woman. But when I was working in uh, doing my studies in Belgium, I was living at the American Seminary. And we had a woman there who was truly the Samaritan woman, married four times, living with a guy, <laughs> just not married to a very colorful woman called Barbara. And uh, she worked in, in housekeeping and so on. And one day, Cardinal Daniels came to the school. Incidentally, he just died recently. He was a marvelous man and a great liturgist. But anyway, he came, and we had the old reception line. He's politely meeting everybody and asking us little questions. So he comes to Barbara, and she introduces herself, said, I I work here in housekeeping. And just, you know, for the sake of conversation, he said, are you married? And she says, well, yes, no, kind of. said, actually, your eminence, I'm living in sin. And they both burst out laughing. (laughs) That was a great, great catechetical moment. Now, then we had a... One of our priests in Ireland, who was an intellectual, and a true intellectual, a little bit above common sense sometimes, you know. But anyway, when he superannuated from university, our provincial put him out into a small rural area. And it wasn't working very well because he was immediately tried to change everything. And so they had this one custom that at funerals, they would have the funeral mass, but then they would wait one hour before going to the cemetery, during which time all the men went to the pub for a pint. Okay. So he decided this is not going to happen anymore, so he stopped it. But this caused a near rebellion. Some of the prisoners, the delegation, they went to see the bishop. They called our provincial in, and our provincial describes the stories, and the farmers tell the bishop, you send us this guy. This Irish said, he's in Egypt. They said, and this guy's stupid, and so on. Finally, he said, this guy is just, you send us an idiot. You send us a, this guy's an idiot. And the bishop said, no, he's not. He said, he's a very highly educated man. He said, he used to teach at university. And one farmer said, well, then send us somebody more ignorant. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This morning, we looked at just the issue, the graying churches and so on. Um, then I give you just some metaphors to, to reflect on. So this afternoon, a little bit moving forward. What's the path forward? And I want to do it in two sections. I want to talk just about some generic Catholic principles, where I call a Catholic approach. I hope that's what's showing on the screen right now. Okay. And then I want to look at what I call Ten Commandments for the Long Haul. So let's look at a Catholic approach. And the first one is, and these are all... Uh, that they're very important principles. To love the world as God loves the world. You know, that sounds so simple, it's not. Um, I want to give you just a a colorful um, example of this. You know, when Mayor John Lindsay, when John Lindsay was mayor of New York in the late 60s, it's just when New York City was going through some of its very worst problems. The garbage people were on strike, you know, the Crime couldn't be controlled. The subways weren't running. The, whatever problems the city could have, they were having it. Uh, race riots in the late 60s. So one day they said on a Friday afternoon, John Lindsay was in a helicopter with some of his councilmen, and they were just flying light, low over the city. And uh, Lindsay looked down at all the traffic, just and horns honking. And he says, God, he said, wouldn't it be great we just pull a plunger and flush it all into the ocean. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, he meant that facetiously, you know. Um, but contrast that to the image of Jesus crying over Jerusalem. You know, so J- Jesus is praying, and he looks at the city, Jerusalem, and he sees the people, and he begins to cry, and he says, uh, they're like sheep without a shepherd. 
there's a deep empathy. Um, and, and see, and that, that's key to all evangelization. That the world, and, and last night, um, Josephine brought that out, you know. See, the world has to know that we're for it. To the extent that the world thinks we're somehow against it or we're trying to impose something, it's not going to work. Um, you know, I talked this morning about my experience teaching this marriage course to young people who didn't want the course. And I always struggle. And that on the nights when I was somehow able to, through tonality or whatever, get through to them that the church was concerned about them, you'd get good questions. Otherwise, it's always defensive, 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 you know. And it's not easy to make that empathic bond, you know. But the world has to know that we're for it. And then we have some chance. Secondly, we have to love the world in spite of its opposition and sin. You know, Paul makes that really clearly and beautifully in Romans, where Paul says, you know, it's, it's hard to die for somebody, but you could die for a good person. You know, or you could die for an innocent child, or you could die. He said, but can you die for somebody who hates you? You know, he said, Jesus was able to die for the world at the very time when it hated him the most. Uh, see, that's, that's where Christian love takes us further than any other place, you know. In fact, you know, Scripture scholars today say that if you want a litmus test for Christianity, they say, what's, what's a litmus test? They say this, can you love truly an enemy? And that's where Jesus' morality takes us further than, than any other morality. You know, We can love those who love us. We can sometimes die for people who are really worth dying for. But can you die for a world that's in opposition to you? See, that's the, that's the test. Then... The third one, be in the world, but not of the world. Now, that, that's the perennial tension, you know. That was the tension that we went into Vatican II with, <clears throat> you know, at, to just make huge swaths here, you know. When John the Twenty Third called Vatican II, his idea was, we're not of the world, but we're not in the world sufficiently. Vatican II was an attempt to be in the world, but not of the world, John Paul II began to rein some things back. Said, "We're now we're too much in the world, we're too much of the world," and see that the perennial tension. Um, and oftentimes it does play out in the liberal conservative tension. You know that again, conservatives protect we're not in the world, not of the world. Liberals protect we need to be in the world. <clears throat> then, to be careful that in challenging the world we are not fighting God. It's interesting. In challenging the world, we are not fighting God. <clears throat> Let me back, back a little bit on this. You know, Scripture says, and the Gospels tell us, that God is the author of all that is good. That is really a far-reaching statement. God is the author of everything that's good. Now, when we see something good, no matter how secular it looks, God is its author, and we cannot be in opposition to it. And oftentimes we are. Sometimes where we lose credibility with our own kids, with the world, and so on, is that we are in opposition to some things that are really good. If they're from God, um, we, we, can't be, we can't have God fighting God. Let me give you again a colorful example. I was living in Rome in 2004 when, um, on our general council when they had the Olympic Games in Athens. And I remember watching the opening of the Olympic Games in our recreation room. A bunch of priests and brothers and so on, seminarians were watching this. And you know, the opening of the Olympic Games today is the ultimate beauty pageant on the planet. You know, you know Miss America isn't the beauty pageant. These are the best bodies in the whole world and $10,000 spandex being paraded before cameras, you know. You know and, and the comments that people say, well, you know, this is all about steroids and this is all about networks and money and this and that, you know, all of which is partly true. It's beside the point. But when you see that kind of beauty, what needs to be your first reaction? Say, wow, that's as good as God makes. See, that, that beauty is real. It's got to be admired because it's real. It's, it's transitory. It passes away soon enough, you know. But see, our first reaction to anything that's good, no matter how secular it is, if it's George Clooney's hair or if, <laughs> if it's Julia Roberts's teeth 
they come from God, you know, the Olympic body and so on. And see, and we, we, we can't be fighting it. We have to somehow integrate it because too often we have God fighting God. And I believe with, our, with young people, part of their reaction to church and so on is an unconscious thing with this, you know, so that um, everything that's good comes from God and it has to be honored. And then we do our, after the admiration, we can start doing our critique. Okay, then, remember the Catholic principle, the world is flawed but not corrupt. Now, it's interesting. I don't, don't think most Catholic, Catholics realize this, but this is one of our differences, uh, key theological differences from Protestantism. You know, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, the great Pro- Pro- Protestant, Re- Protestant reformers, They said that original sin corrupted human nature, not flawed it. It corrupted human nature so on your own you can't do anything that's good, only through grace. But then they would also look at the world. If it isn't explicitly graced, it's not from God. That's never been the Catholic principle. Remember, we we have always been believers in natural theology. We believe that original sin flawed human nature, but it didn't corrupt human nature. So that's very important. So when we, our theology of God, when we teach God in whatever catechal way and, or, or homiletic way we do it, we always have to make sure that people know that God is still looking down on this world pleased and, and blessing. God is not looking on our world right now in our lives and saying, this is a cesspool. Um, I better read do, do the incarnation, you know. No, God is still looking down <laughs> in Genesis. It's good. It's good. It's very good. And that text is repeated then in the baptism of Jesus, where Jesus' head comes out of the water and the heavens open up and the voice says, this is my blessed one, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I take delight. God is still taking delight on this planet. And we got to preach out of that as opposed to, that's the Catholic stance. Okay. Then the last point there in a Catholic approach to live in hope and faith, the gospel can stand up to the present age. What's behind that is this. You know, I think there's been an unconscious fear, which was really triggered by the Enlightenment. You know, when, when Freud said this morning, he says, faith is a spent project. See, the Enlightenment really put into the Western mind the idea that if you study enough, if you go into enough dark corners, you look at science really hard, eventually you'll stop believing. You know, there's a, there's a marvelous book, first of all, by a marvelous woman, but if you haven't read, read, read Marilyn Robinson, the, the, the novelist, but more recently she's not writing novels anymore, she's writing theology books. But um, her first attempt at was, was a book called, a marvelous book called, When I Was a Child, I Read Books. When I Was a Child, I Read Books. Now, she is a Calvinist, but she's a marvelous um, apologetic today for Christianity because she is, first of all, one bright, bright woman. But she says, you know what we've done? She said, we have inhaled the very bias against us. The Enlightenment put this bias, which say basically if you become bright enough, if you ask enough questions, if you're searingly honest and courageous and where in all the dark corners you look at, you'll stop believing. So you know some said, now we believe it too. <laughs> they said, we, we have inhaled the bias against us. It's, just, it's not worthy of Christianity. It's not worthy of God. It's not worthy of Christ. You know, you know, somehow we think that modern science or whatever is brighter than our creator. Uh, that's almost the unconscious fear. So, so we have to be fearless. We have to be fearless in the face of modern science, in the face of modern sociology, in the face of modern ideology and so on. God can take care of himself or herself, whatever God is. The church will withstand all of that and then some. It's like Barth said, God is going to judge the world. Don't worry about what the world is doing to God. Okay, so those are some Catholic principles. Now, commandments for the long haul. We need a a shift of... uh, I hope you're seeing 10 there now. Okay, you got it. Because this morning I got a little bit behind and so on. First of all, to recognize the urgency, centrality, and gospel mandate of the new evangelization. And that's we've been talking about that last night and, and all today. So I'm not going to emphasize that, re-emphasize that. 
Today it's really urgent that we, um, and notice the word is new evangelization. See, the first evangelization went to people who had never heard about Christ. Today, um, the hardest and the toughest evangelical field in the whole world is right here, North America, Western Europe. We, we know a lot more about how to be missionaries in Africa and Asia and other places than we know how to be in Ottawa and Vancouver and Calgary and, and, and our own cities. So that the, the new field is our own kids, our own culture, who've heard about Christ. They've heard about the church, but they're not really evangelized. <laughs> See, so this is a new task. You, you're trying to re-evangelize some people who have been vaguely touched by this and so on. And, but that's also, it's urgent. I mean, that's why you call it this conference. Okay, secondly, to work at re-inflaming the romantic imagination that brings together energy and wisdom. Okay. What is the romantic imagination? Usually we think of the imagination as just one piece. You know, George Lucas has a great imagination about Star Wars, or people have a great imagination. Um, Tolkien, who wrote Lord of the Rings, he had a great imagination. He not only invented a whole world, he invented a language and so on. This is incredible imagination, okay? But imagination breaks down into different categories. For instance, we have an intellectual imagination, which the church has wonderfully and massively renewed in our time. You know what's happened in the last 70 years? We have renewed and kind of reinfused the intellectual imagination of Catholicism in a, just a wonderful way. In the last 70 years, we have wonderful books and scripture studies we've never had before. Dogmatic histories, you know, histories of everything that today academically Catholicism and theology in general is in a really good place. You know, I live at a graduate school of theology. Our library, we have enough good books in there to save three planets, you know. Sadly, the seminarians don't go in there much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking at phone screens and so on. Um, but, you know, we, we, we have better preaching. We have better theology books. We have scripture studies. You know, I studied scripture as a seminarian in, in the late 60s. And at that time, if I was doing an essay, I could read all the stuff in English that was published. Today, it would be a joke. If you're teaching a course in St. John, there'll be 80 new books or articles published within one semester. You know, so that uh, just we have this explosion and we have all the intellectual tools we need. But our kids aren't going to church. Okay. Now, it's not because there's something wrong with the intellect. We have to shift to the heart. What we've been unable to do recently, and that is we haven't been able to get people to fall in love with the church. That's something different. You know, um, see, that's a, that's a romantic, emotional thing. I'll give you a simple example, two examples. Those of you who are old enough, if not, get it on Netflix. But we've yet an old movie by Bing Crosby in the 50s called Going My Way. <laughs> See, some of you laugh. Remember that. Now, this was, a, was a, a story of a young priest in New York, completely over the top in terms of idealization. This guy was Jesus, Mother Teresa, Jerry Seinfeld, everything melted into one, and so on, and a marvelous singer besides. You know? But you know what happened with that movie? Seminaries filled up. People fell in love with the concept of the priesthood. The same thing happened with Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton, in 1948, wrote this book, Seven Story Mountain, and he wrote it in first fervor. That's like a, um, um, a couple writing a book on marriage on their honeymoon, just way over the top. This is the greatest thing ever, and so on. Not real, but great. Well, the same thing. Monasteries filled up for a whole generation. Trappists had to beat men back with a stick. You know, everybody discovered their inner monk, and everybody had this. But, you know, it wasn't completely real, but it was powerful. It caught the romantic imagination of, of, a, of a whole generation, you know. And it's interesting. We look at some of the great reformers in history. Take Francis of Assisi, you know. We attribute certain prayers to him and so on. We're not sure he even wrote those, you know. But... What he did, he's been one of the most powerful, single, influential peoples in history, you know, certainly in Christian history, like Jesus and so on. But 
he re-inflamed the romantic imagination of his era. When he took off his clothes and walked naked out of Assisi and turned his back on his father, that wasn't much of a theological gesture. It was a powerful romantic gesture, and we've got 700 good years off of that, you know. Now today, because we need new imagination, people are trying to redo that. They say, no, Francis did that. Been done. <laughs> okay. It's not good. You can't necessarily repeat it and so on. See, we need a new Francis. We need a new Claire. And, and God will send us those people. That's where my hope lies, you know. Um, the church has been in this situation and much worse situations before. And always, you know, you can use this image. You know, when they put Jesus in the tomb, they put a big stone over it. A day and a half later, the stone rolled away. Every time you bury Jesus, bury the church or whatever, the stone's going to roll away, you know, because we're working with a live God. We're working with a live spirit and so on. But the point I'm making here is that this is going to be our task today. We, I'm a theologian. I struggle with this. I know how to work theologically, but I don't know how to work romantically or emotionally. You know, to give you an example, so many of your kids... Their struggles with the church are not intellectual, you know, um, and then we're trying to address them intellectually. You know, they tell a story about Cardinal Newman, and they said his brother was a hard agnostic who would write him all these letters, how can you believe this, and how can you believe in the resurrection, how can you believe in a miracle, and how can you believe in the virginity of Mary, and he'd write back these long treaties trying to explain it and so on. So one day he wrote back and said, I'm not writing you anymore. He said, you don't have an intellectual problem. You have an emotional issue. And all the letters in the world aren't going to cure that. And he's right. Like a lot of times, the arguments they have can't be met with arguments. I mean, you still have to do the intellectual part. But somehow there's an emotional, there's a romantic thing. And I think the real work of the church is to, is to find the romantic images we have to get our kids to fall in love with the church again, to fall in love with religious life, and so on. Um, or just, you know, the Oblates in Canada, for 100 years, 150 years, we had all kinds of very idealistic young men from France who read books about the Canadian North, and they came over <laughs> to the North. There was this powerful romantic ideal. So a young kid growing up in Normandy and you're reading a book in French about the missionaries up with the Eskimos and they show pictures of igloos and so on. And they got inflamed and they became missionaries and went to northern Canada and spent their lives there. You know, um, Somehow, Thomas Merton, um, going my way, we have to find ways of, of, you know, I think that's the new evangelization. It's going to be most, uh, largely a work of romanticism. That, you know, we have to somehow... Get to the emotions. <clears throat> then thirdly, emphasize both catechesis and theology. <clears throat> you know, catechesis is not theology, and theology isn't catechesis, and evangelization le- needs them badly, both of them. The new evangelization, we badly need catechesis, and we badly need theology. What is, what's the difference between theology and catechesis? Well, I can give you the thing, the definition quite simply, but I'm going to give you some images. Catechesis, catechism, is to instruct in the basics. You know, at a, as a catechist, you are trying to give them the basics of the faith. You know, theology is meant to, as, as Anselm gave the great definition, he says it's faith trying to understand itself. So you're trying to give them something beyond that once they have the basics, and the basics need to be there, um, then you give them something so that they can grow in their hearts and in their imagination, their minds. As the world changes, they, they, can, they can keep that catechesis there. You know, there's a, um, refer to a book, there's a, a marvelous book, came out two years ago, not written by a Catholic, um, no, I can't think of her name, but the book is called My Utmost. My Utmost. And it's the story of a young evangelical girl. She writes this. Um, grew up in, in Dallas, Texas. And um, she grew up in a strong evangelical church. She said, my mother, my aunt, she so on. She said, they, they believe in Jesus for real. And so did she. But she goes to New York to try to become a writer. 
and she would get in the literary world of Detroit, and all of a sudden, um, everybody around her is an atheist. They're agnostic. They're ridiculing religion. They're ridiculing her, her Pentecostalism. They're ridiculing Jesus. And this is a real faith crisis for her. So the story is how she regrounded her childhood faith, you know, um, so that today she's a writer actually living in Paris with a strong Christian faith, but she just traces what she had to do to take her childhood faith and her childhood catechesis and just theologize it and bring it to a level where, she, you know, she can live in the ultimate sophisticated world and she's still a little girl from Dallas with solid faith. Um, see, theology is that second trip, you know. Um, now, I'm going to say a couple of other things about it, <clears throat> where the tension is. This is also liberal conservative tension. Catechesis is conservative by definition. Theology is liberal by definition, and hence the tension, you know. See, the catechesis, you're forming young seedlings, you know, the, the original word seminary, today, you know, they train priests and ministers in seminaries. But the original word for seminary in Latin is seminarium is a greenhouse. Now, in the northern climate, you know what you use a greenhouse for? You start young seedling plants who can't survive outside with frost and so on. You start your tomatoes early, and then, but there's a point where you have to take them out of the greenhouse. And the danger is if you take them out too early, they die. If you take them out too late, they don't fully form their roots, you know. See, so catechesis is seminarium. You are working with young seedling plants, and it's very important that you work with them. There's a whole pedagogy that goes with that, you know. That's why a lot of times theologians shouldn't be doing catechesis. They're giving them all kinds of things. You're, you're teaching them basics. But then theology takes that. You're trying to train adults, leaders, and so on. You know, uh, I've been a head of a theology school the last 14 years, and uh, I've had to defend this both ways. It's been one of the great tensions in my life. With faculty and stuff, you're always defending catechesis, you know. And you shouldn't even have a catechism. Well, what kind of book is that? Why would you have a catechism and so on? And then with um, bishops sometimes, <laughs> especially vocation directors, they're saying, why not just teach them the catechism? That's all they need to know. You know. I remember one time talking to Texas bishops, and I said, you know, that theology is liberal by definition. I said, really? Why? I said, have you ever heard of a conservative arts college? There is no such a thing. <laughs> they're, they're called liberal arts college for a reason. If you read Cardinal Newman, it's probably one of the great books on education ever written, the idea of a university. See, that's meant to stretch you. It's meant to turn leaders. So, for instance, in a seminary, we're, like, we're, trying, we're putting out doctors. They're going to be like general practitioners. They can't, they, they got to be exposed to all this stuff, particularly today, because they're going to have a lot of parishioners who are, are asking lots of hard questions and so on. See, so we need both, and they, they need to um, have a reconciliation, you know, come together, because we so vitally need both. I'll give you another example. I came to Albany School of Theology in 2005, and at the time, um, we had a lot of young seminarians who were really fighting theology. They'd come to our school, and no kidding. Some of them would bring the catechism into scripture classes, and they were vetting Jesus against the catechism, you know? Now, no, and they were wonderful young men with, with real faith, but you know, they'd never been catechized. They had never been catechized, so everything frightened them. And our bishop at the time was very bright. You know what he did? He said, from now on, unless they have such and such a background, they're going to do a probaductic year. Proba, I can't even pronounce it, but anyway, <coughs> probaductic year. So almost like an officiate. And they would spend the year studying the catechism. You know what happened afterwards? They never fought theology anymore. See, my generation, we'd go to the seminaries. We were highly catechized. I memorized three catechisms as a kid, Baltimore Catechism 1, 2, and 3. So we were ready for theology. A lot of the people coming in today, they have a deep faith, uh, but they have no, they're not catechized, you know. So they have a, they're on fire for Jesus, but literally they can't tell the difference between the Mass and the Rosary, you know. Um, and sometimes Mary's way more important than Jesus and so on. 
probably is, but that's not the point. <laughs> okay. And, you know, but they haven't been catechized, and then they're fighting with each other, and of course the theologians are fighting them. Theologians oftentimes aren't empathetic. They're, they blow them out of the water, you know, get rid of that catechism, and all we're about, and so on. Um, we need to have a rapprochement here between catechesis and theology. You know, theology should say this to, about catechism. Say, when Jesus says, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. Theology doesn't abolish catechetics, it brings it to fulfillment. <laughs> but that better be there, you know. See, so, and again, oftentimes it's a liberal conservative tension, but we need both. We so badly need both the catechism and the catechesis, not just the catechism, and theology. You have to be equally sympathetic to both of those. Then we need a multiplicity of languages. And by languages here, I don't just mean languages, you know, English, French, German, Spanish, so on, although we need that too. Incidentally, as a little footnote, you know, that Christianity is unique in that Christianity is a, la is a religion of translation. Have you ever wonder about that? Christianity is a religion of translation. For instance, Islam isn't. To read the Koran, really, you have to read it only in one language, you know. Now, it's interesting when you read the way Luke writes of Pentecost. They came out of the Pentecost room, and everybody heard them speaking in their own language. They didn't say, we all understand Greek and Hebrew. <laughs> no, everybody hears them in their own language. We, we are a, a religion of translation. There is no lingua franca for, for Christianity. It's every language. Okay, now, but I mean languages here in a wider sense. <clears throat> you know... Precisely, languages that, and, and last night, uh, Josephine spoke well to that, you know. You gotta speak to the heart, you gotta speak to the intellect, you gotta speak to beauty, you gotta speak to the worker. Um, you know, in Hinduism, if you ever study Hindu spirituality, which is actually quite profound, because Hinduism's been around longer than Christianity, you know. There's been millions of good men and women <laughs> who, who uh, you know, ha have put, given their souls over to this, you know. But they have four spiritualities. So they have a spirituality for people who are lovers. If, you know, if you're a person of the heart and romanticism, they have a spirituality for that. It's called a bhakti yoga. And incidentally, Gandhi, Gandhi was, was that. And Gandhi says, in bhakti yoga, he said, the greatest book ever written is the New Testament. <laughs> he says, if you're a lover, Jesus is for you. There's been no spirituality ever written, you know, but not everybody's like that. Some people are a worker. And, um, you know, some people want a great love in their lives. Others just want to build a deck off the porch, you know. Uh, and, that, okay. and you need a spirituality for them, you know. Others are intellectuals. Some people need the language of the intellect. I'll give you two quotes in a row here. Morris West. Well, I'll give the other one first. Bernard Lonergan, out of Toronto, one of the great intellectuals we've produced. Bernard Lonergan, quoting Thomas Aquinas, or leading on Thomas Aquinas, says, no, there's no conversion ex that's not intellectual. That intellectual conversion is, is what drives everything. Morris West, the great Catholic writer, says, <clears throat> um, the beginning of all conversion is falling in love. See, there's a lover, there's an intellectual, and then there's workers and stuff who aren't interested in either. Then there's still artists, who are relating to God's beauty. And, you know, we have to be able to, to maneuver in those languages, you know. You know, philosophically, and that's still worth knowing, our philosophy professor in the seminary has made us memorize that back and forth and back and forth. They say, there are four transcendental properties to God. God is one, true, good, and beautiful. You know, just... One, true, good, and beautiful. Those are the transcendental properties. And some people relate to one, some to the other. Some relate to God's goodness, some relate to God's beauty, some relate to God's truth, some relate to God's oneness, and so on. That, uh, and see, spirituality has to, it has to speak all those languages. You know? See, so be weary if someone says, it's only about the head. Be weary if someone says, it's only about romantic. <laughs> be weary if someone says, it's only about the intellect. 
Uh, no, it's, it's about the head and the heart and the intellect and five other things. Okay, then, appeal to the idealism of people, particularly the young. You know, there, there's so much cynicism in our world, there, and there's so much also deconstruction. And, and a lot of the deconstruction is actually valuable. You know, you know, I live in the, intellect, in, in the world of the academy, you know, and during the last, say, 60, 70 years, the academic world has done powerful, powerful deconstructive work. They have construct, deconstructed everything. So if you drink a cup of coffee in Starbucks, they can tell you exactly who got what penny and who did everything and lay it all out. And they can tell you exactly what's wrong with everything, except this, we can't build anything. We can't build a toilet. Now we can tell you what's wrong with your toilet, <laughs> but we can't, you know, deconstruction is very valuable. It's the first step, but it doesn't give you the positive. Incidentally, that's how John the Baptist defines himself against Jesus. You know, when they said, are you the Messiah? He says, no. He says, uh, I come baptizing with water, and he comes baptizing with fire. He said, I'm not even worthy to undo his sandal strap. What's the difference between water and fire? I'll give you a simple example. Imagine you're walking along the shore, and you find an old lamp buried in the sand, been there for a long time. And you bring it home, and you power wash it. you got to power wash it and just absolutely take all the sand off there. Now you've got it in its pristine form, but you haven't changed anything. But see, fire can melt it down and change its shape and turn it into something else. So John the Baptist said, you know what I do? I'm a deconstructionist. I can tell you everything that's wrong with you. Now, I can't fix you, <laughs> but see, Jesus can tell you what's wrong with you, and Jesus can fix you. See, it's not just, you know, this is what's wrong. And see, part of where we've come from and evolved in our theology and our preaching and so on, we've been too much um, not emphasizing um, the ideal. Now, you know who's the model there in our generation? It was John Paul. John Paul got this. Like, for instance, World Youth Days. It was a marvelous piece of imagination, but also in, in general. Notice how young people love John Paul. <clears throat> but notice he didn't cut him any slack, but he would appeal to their idealism. He'd say, you're too good a person to be doing that. I want to call you to something higher. Like, just always think of something, you know. And, so, and, and he had a powerful effect, you know. Notice he didn't criticize young people. Um, he, he just called them something higher, something higher, something higher, you know. You know, when he first proposed youth, World Youth Days, the curator told him, that's not going to work. You're not going to these young kids come out to see an old man. They were wrong. <laughs> you know? They came out to see the old man. They came out to see him in spades, you know. Um, see, and he, he would bring together this wisdom and energy, the old man who at the end couldn't even walk straight and so on, and all these kids, and in the, in the, just kind of in the, in the power of their youthful energy brought them together. That's what, that's what it should look like. You know. Now, we don't know how to replicate World Youth Days all over the planet and so on, um, but notice the appeal to idealism. We've got to appeal to ideal kids. It, we have to gently correct, you know, say, you shouldn't be doing this, but we have to give them something higher, something higher. And, um, okay. Then, evangelize, Jason, evangelize beyond the ide ideology of the right and the left. <clears throat> I talked about that this morning. Uh, you know, s the liberal conservatives, we have to resolve our marital differences. You know, this is a marriage that may never be broken up. <laughs> and, you know, we, we have to stop fighting with each other because we're not each other's enemies. We need each other. But then also in that we have to stop getting caught up in the ideologies of the right and the left. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in ideology which can look a little like religion. What's the difference between ideology and religion? I'll give you a story. I was listening to the radio one day in on NPR, and they had this, this woman. She's an Episcopalian priest, from woman from San Francisco, who's traveling around the United States. She does a lot of work on ecology, taking care of the planet, Ecoethics and so on. Very powerful. But the announcer asked her this. He said, you know, you're, you're out of San Francisco. It's about as liberal as it gets, you know. So, and, and, you know, they're all into that and climate change. But how does your message go over, say, in Oklahoma, Arkansas, 
West Texas, <laughs> where you're meeting some, some, some people who don't believe all this stuff, you know. She had a very interesting answer. She says, you know, some said, I find that if I stay with the gospel, if I preach the gospel, she said, sincere people hear the gospel. She said, the second I slide into any ideology, they eat me alive. He said, and they should. You know, see, Greenpeace says some true things. It's not the gospel, you know, um, or vice versa. You know, you have, the, I mean, the, the, not the Catholic, well, part two, but the Christian right in nine says have simply aligned themselves with Donald Trump and that agenda. You know, well, that's not the gospel. You know, see, so that it's so easy for the right to align themselves with the causes of the right, for the left to align themselves with the causes of the left. And see, then we're partly gospel and partly ideology. You can join Greenpeace and do some good work, but don't sell that from the pulpit. <laughs> That's an ideology which carries some good things. You know, the gospel is something else. And see, so we have to stop aligning ourselves with ideology and we have to, uh, and also start getting along with each other because we need each other. The author I recommend on this is Jim Wallace, the sojourner's person in, in the United States. Uh, Jim writes eloquently and has for an entire generation on this. And Jim Wallace always says, don't go to the right, don't go to the left, Go deeper, you know. Uh, stay with Jesus, not with liberal ideology or conservative ideology. Then, remain Catholic in our evangelization. Now, I gave you some Catholic principles. I want to give you one more. Just around the word Catholic. As we evangelize and so on, catechize and theologize, we need to always remain Catholic. What is a Catholic? Well, Catholic isn't the opposite of Protestant, you know, because <laughs> Protestants also say we're one holy Catholic and apostolic church, you know. Catholic is the word, the word means universal, means wide. The opposite of a Catholic isn't a Protestant. The opposite of a Catholic is a fundamentalist of any kind. See, Jesus said, Jesus said, in my father's house there are many rooms. And when he said that, he wasn't talking about architecture in the sky. He was talking about the scope, the scope of his, his father's heart. See, God's heart is universal. Okay, Our hearts often aren't. Kesson Zakis, the great Greek writer, says, the bosom of God is not a ghetto. That's what line. God's bosom is not a ghetto, he said, but the heart of man often is. You know what a fundamentalist is? A fundamentalist, it's, it's a heart with one room. Oftentimes, it's a good room. I'm about dogma or I'm about abortion, or I'm about this, and so on. That, that's, that's a good room, but it's one room. It's one room, you know. We have to have many rooms. You know, Jesus gives us a stretching principle that I'm still <laughs> not sure I'm comfortable with, you know, where Jesus says, be compassionate the way your heavenly Father is compassionate. Okay, sounds safe enough until he spells it out. He doesn't say, be compassionate the way that's defined in the dictionary, of psychological health, or the way Eric Fromm defined this. He said, be compassionate the way that your Heavenly Father is compassionate because your Heavenly Father lets his sun, the sun up in the sky, shine on the bad as well as the good, the righteous and unrighteous. It's quite a statement. He said, God loves, and God's love is completely non-discriminatory. It works like the sun. When the sun shines, it doesn't say, I like vegetables but not weeds. Vegetables get sun, weeds don't get the sun. It just shines. And the vegetables and weeds both drink it up. So he's saying God just loves, and God loves everybody the same. He loves the angels in heaven, the devils in hell. He loves Mary, the mother of Jesus. He loves Lucifer, <clears throat> and he loves them the same. Now, that's safe enough. That means he loves pro-life and pro-choice equally. He loves liberals and conservatives equally. You know, he loves Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton equally, <laughs> and so on. Um, he loves Protestants and Catholics and so on. Now, we may be responding differently, <clears throat> but not only that, he said, he asks us to do that. See, that's universality. I said that once in a church in Austin, and a man said, well, that's the most wishy-washy thing I've ever heard. So it's boundaryless. Take it up with Jesus. No, it's not boundaryless. It sounds boundaryless. But true love actually 
it, be, it makes those distinctions in the law. Need an example of that? I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Some years ago, a woman came to me and she says, I'm a good Catholic woman, and I've really tried to raise my kids the way they should, but they're kids. She says, so my daughter is getting married in Hawaii by a swami. Now, can I go? <laughs> and if I go, am I saying I'm supporting her and all this type of stuff, you know? I said, she's your daughter, go. And she's not stupid. She knows that you're supporting her and not supporting what she's doing. You know, you get the difference? You know, we love... Oh, no, aren't you a saint? Okay, thanks. <laughs> When, when we actually love somebody, if, if we are who we are, that love itself makes those distinctions. You know, your kids know what you stand for, okay, uh, but you don't back away. Now, there are times when you can also back away. This is not a simple thing, you know, because you also at certain times have to hold your moral ground. So I'll give you another example, and these aren't made up. <laughs> Imagine you have one of your kids... They're at university, and you know they're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend. So they're coming home for some holiday, and the boyfriend or girlfriend comes along. So then the awkward thing about the sleeping arrangements, you know. And they say, well, mom, you know, at university, you can stay. No, but this is not university. This is our house. And this house is not going to happen, you know. See, you're holding your moral ground, you know. See, even as you're loving. See, so there's two ways you can answer that question, the Swami in Hawaii. And so you can also say, that might be a little stronger said, I'm not going, um, you know, I don't believe in this, and so on. But see, at all times, they still have to know that we love them. We can hold our moral ground sometimes. At times, you can cede moral ground knowing that they understand your moral ground. Um, and so that these are tricky things. Okay. Um, remain Catholic then. Finally, preach the freedom of the gospel and it's called today for a new maturity. This is an important one. You know, today, um, when you look around, you, you <laughs> the danger is you can say, we're all on a slippery slope, but we need is we really need to rein a lot of stuff in, you know, and maybe we do. But let me start the reverse. Jesus, Jesus was the freest man who ever walked this planet, Okay. And not just free in the abstract sense that he was God's son. Jesus went into the singles bars of his time. Jesus went and visited prostitutes, except he didn't sin. See, and that's the new maturity that's being called for. Today, it's not so much, can, can we get society to take away people's freedoms? Can they somehow, you know, um, it's, we have to, well, you know, we owe our kids and owe our society. You have to be witnesses of a way of walking in this world with all its freedoms in fidelity. You know, Jesus walked in complete freedom, but he walked in fidelity, you know. Um, and, uh, and at times, you also have to be honest about that, what you can do and what you can't do. I'll give you again a powerful example, Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen was a saint, but he was always a saint in progress. Henry struggled mightily in many areas of his life, always essentially faithful, but he was a deeply honest man. You know, in the last years of his life, oftentimes when he went out to give lectures and stuff, he wouldn't travel alone. He would take somebody from Larsh with him. And he'd always say, well, you know, we're in a community. But more privately, Henry would say, you know why I do this? He said, I'm not mature enough to travel alone. He said, I'm in a hotel room and there's pornography on television. I might watch it. When I'm with somebody, I won't. See, so part of maturity is also admitting our immaturity, you know, and also, it's something we have to teach our kids. When they say, Mom, you don't trust me. You say, of course, I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't trust myself or the Pope in that particular situation and so on. You know, so we have to be honest. But, but also, the movement forward is not to rein it back. We can't bring back the 1950s. You know, um, we have to bring the year 2030 and 40, where we have to show our kids, with show generous, how you can walk in this freedom. Freedom is a good thing. You know, today we live in the Western world. We live in the greatest freedoms that men and women have ever walked with on this planet. And that's a great gift from God. 
You and I are the freest men and women who have ever walked this planet. No medieval king or something had what you have, you know. But he brings a different kind of responsibility, you know. So the opportunities for sin, for failure, for everything are just, they're infinitesimal, you know. So we have to say, you can do this. So we have to witness to a new maturity, you know, so that, you know, evangelization isn't just about a technique and who has the best catechetical technique and theology. It's going to be the end. Your catechetical tool is your own life of fidelity. Your body and your life is the most important catechetical tool you have. You know, we got to witness how this can be done. Then, because time is running here, give a special witness to fidelity. You know, each, each age has its own archetypal flaw. And our archetypal flaw in our age is infidelity and transience. You know, nothing lasts, nothing lasts, you know. Um, and after a while, it's hard to believe in the gospel. It's hard to believe in eternal things when you never experience anything except transience and infidelity on this side of eternity. Give me an example. I have an older brother who just retired and he was an Indian missionary up north, northern Saskatchewan, for many years. And he had been a college professor before he went up there. And he went up there when he was 60, wound down his academic career and became an Indian missionary. <laughs> and he has a sense of humor. He tells some humorous stories from his first years. He said his first couple of years, he said he'd make an appointment. The people were very nice to him. He'd make an appointment, and they always broke it, always. So he'd well, drop in at our house at 8 o'clock. He'd come, nobody home. They we say, we'll see you at the rectory at 7. Wouldn't show up. So after a while, he caught on. This wasn't just accidental. He went to see one of the elders, and he says, you know, these people make appointments and they never keep them. The elder burst out laughing. He says, of course, they're not going to keep them. He said, the last thing they need is a white man arranging their life for them. <laughs> so my brother said, what should you do? He said, well, he said, pragmatically, he said, don't make an appointment. Just drop in on me. <laughs> he said, they'll be nice to you. But then he gave the other advice. He said, what can he say? He said, stay here for a long time. Stay here for a long time, then they'll trust you. He said, why should they trust you? They've been betrayed by everybody. He said, you know, they want to find out whether you're a tourist or whether you're a missionary. He said, so stay for a long time. And he said, and every year he stayed, they trusted him more and more and more. You know, see, there's no, there's no shortcut to fidelity. <laughs> he said, they want to see whether you're a missionary or whether you're a tourist. He said, and they've been betrayed and taken by everybody. Come on, on. A friend for life, and a day later you get a better offer and you're gone, you know. And, um, you know, we have a joke in the Oblates when, when somebody doesn't show up for something, say, well, obviously something better came along. <laughs> okay. But, you know, but that's almost a critique of our age, you know. We stay with each other even in marriages and stuff till something better comes along. So our age really needs a fidelity to witness, you know. We need it in marriage. We need it in religious life. We need it just in friendship. We need it, period, you know because we see so little of it. You know, when Martin Luther King was being buried, 1968, in fact, he was, just, I think, yesterday or the day before was the anniversary of his, his death and so on. But as the cameras were rolling away from the, from the funeral, they were interviewing people, and they came to this old man who was crying. They said to him, what does this man mean to you? And the old man said, he was a great man. He said, a great man said, because he was faithful. He was faithful, said, he stayed with us when we weren't with staying with. You know, he stayed with us when we weren't with staying He was a faithful man. There's a lot to that line, you know. See, we need to stay with our churches, families, communities, um, catechetical offices with a lot of tension, <laughs> all kinds of this stuff. You know, we need a special witness to fidelity. I like what that chief told my brother. He said, what can I do? He said, stay for a long time. That's what you can do. Notice it wasn't some technique, you know. Well, do this, phone them and catch them off guard. Just stay for a long time. There's no substitute for that. Okay. You know, and remember scripture says, the one who perseveres to the end is the one who's going to be saved. Then lastly, very important today, never bracket the essentials. Respect, charity, and graciousness, and be patient with each other and with God. That sounds so obvious, but it's not. You know, I live in the United States right now. Um, I know how it is here. There, it is just awful. Like the political rhetoric, the civic rhetoric, and oftentimes the church rhetoric is just riddled with everything. No respect. No, you know, it's just a, um, 
everybody's the, the, the civil discourse is broken down. And it, it happens in government circles, but it also it's beginning to happen in church circles where people are just, you know, whatever else you agree with or don't agree with, you know, never, never break down on respect, graciousness, charity, no matter how big the cause, you know. Or you see it in all social justice groups all the time. Somebody is going to be in somebody's face, you know. You're a baby butcher. You know, that's rhetoric. That's awful, um, you know. It's like somebody who, who burns a flag for peace. What's wrong with burning a flag for peace? Easy. Everything. <laughs> Everything's wrong with that. You're taking something that's precious to somebody. You're violating it, putting it back in faces. Now love me. Um, you know, see, so what, whatever else, we may never, with your kids, with, with each other, we can never get beyond that essential. Respect, charity, graciousness. Um, and then be patient. Um, um, Léon Blois, the French philosopher who was the major influence on the life of Théodore and the on, on, on Raïs de Raouissa and Jacques Maritain. Great line, he says, in this world, God protects himself only by his patience and his beauty. Isn't that a great line? In this life, God protects himself only by his patience and his beauty. God doesn't shoot a gun. God doesn't twist anybody's arm. God doesn't strike anybody with lightning, you know. God lies like a baby in a crib, completely helpless, because that's the way God was born in this world. Babies can't protect themselves. Uh, they protect themselves by their helplessness. But he said God protects himself by his patience and his beauty. I want to end with that line. Um, that's, go forth from here and say, <laughs> I have two things that, above all, I want to be patient and we respect beauty. Uh, and we respect beauty by graciousness, charity, and so on. This sounds like, you know, a, a book from the self-help, the 12 Habits of Ordinary People, and so on. But, no, this is a very important theological line today. Okay. Um, we're three minutes before. Uh, I have to first check with, with uh, Margaret whether I'm going to get paid fully if I punt for these three minutes. or Will I still get the full stipend? <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's been wonderful being with you, and thanks for your patience with me. Thanks. Thanks.